Well, first I want to say Happy New Year to everyone, particularly my subscribers, and especially I want to thank my Patreon and PayPal supporters. Today I want to do another Veritasian reaction video. This one guest starred Sean Carroll on the Mini World series. And as I've discussed before about Mini Worlds and that version of Mini Worlds Multiverses, is that it's fictitious. And the biggest problem I find with it is it's anti-deterministic. It denies cause and effect. One thing we, we have to know with science is that causes follow effects. And even logic, if A then B. If you take away the cause and effect relationship, you take away science and logic and all reason. So we must have causes. And it's the physicist's job to figure out the causes. And then another important point is the universe functions without human interaction. Certainly we interact with things on Earth and screw up our planet, but everywhere else in the universe it doesn't, it doesn't need us. It does, we don't do anything. We, we have, our effect is negligent. And so we have to think about physics interactions occurring everywhere without observations, without measurements from us or any other intelligent being. That there are causes happening, causing effects all the time regardless. Now another important thing is wave equations are equations. They're not physical. They're not a physical description of something physically real. They're not the physicality of the universe or even the physicality of an electron. Because when we look at the physicality of an electron, we get something that's much more defined. We get a particle. We must trust the science of observation. What we observe is what things are. Wave equations are great for describing states and probabilities, but they don't describe what things are. Now that's not to say there aren't physical waves. Photons have waves, electrons and protons have waves. And these physical waves do exist and they have a physical medium, and it's the medium we need to focus on. Even then we can't say, oh, we just deal with the wave equation and we forget about the medium. No, we can't do that. And so everything that's real is made from particles or collections of particles, and we must keep that in mind. It's not made of wave equations. And with that, I'll let Derek give his introduction. In quantum mechanics, we never actually observe the wave function like this. Instead, when we measure it, we find the particle at a single point in space. So how are we to reconcile the spread out wave function evolving smoothly under the Schrodinger equation with this point-like particle detection? Now, I think it's understandable that when the founders of quantum theory approached this problem, they considered the measurement more real than the wave function. After all, the measurement was something we had actually observed, and it matches our experience of a world of matter particles. It was harder to say what the wave function was exactly. Well, as you can already see, he's already gone against all the sensical physics that I already discussed. And a couple other things I wanted to say is that when people talk about superpositions of states or entanglements, that is one way of avoiding saying what the cause is in the cause and effect relationship. And as happens so many times in my videos, the ultimate problem comes down to this physics was developed by quantum field deniers. And since they're denying the existence of the quantum field, they don't feel like they need to describe everything. They can just say, oh, it's all probability. It just 
happens probabilistically. No, there's causes. And the causes happen due to some probabilistic interaction. But what we see, and in one case in particular, radioactive decay, must have a trigger, it must have a cause. And that cause is an interaction with a quantum fluctuation. And I've done several videos on that, I'll link. But basically, if you have a neutron and you have an electron and a positron, the positron interacts with the neutron, which annihilates the electron-like component of the neutron, turning it into a proton, and then the electron becomes free. And if you use those types of quantum fluctuation interactions, you can explain all of the beta decay modes. And you can explain the distribution of energy of the electrons and positrons that are emitted. So we don't have to have this magical probabilistic decay happening. The decay really happens or it doesn't and it's guided by a probabilistic interaction with quantum fluctuation. Now there are also many other quantum fluctuation interactions that are causes of various effects. Things like quantum jumps and things like black body radiation and spontaneous emission of energy from electrons. And so we have to consider all those things and, and even more that we need to discover or discover the details. And once we do that, we understand what's going on with an interaction. And we don't have things that are entangled or superimposed. They either happen or they didn't happen because there's an actual cause that makes it happen. And with that, I'll play a, a longer clip. At each point in space, the wave function has a complex amplitude, essentially just a real number plus an imaginary number. Max Born suggested if you take that amplitude and square it, you get the probability of finding the particle there. The fact that you have to square the amplitude actually appears as a last-minute footnote in Born's paper, but that is how probability was introduced into the core of our picture of reality. That's a pretty big philosophical leap. I mean, no longer is the universe deterministic. This made a lot of scientists, especially Einstein, uncomfortable. But the Born Rule, as it is now called, remains at the heart of quantum mechanics because it is spectacularly successful at predicting the outcomes of experiments. So the way quantum mechanics came to be understood, and the way I learned it, is that there are two sets of rules. When you're not looking, the wave function simply evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. But when you are looking, when you make a measurement, the wave function collapses suddenly and irreversibly. And the probability of measuring any particular outcome is given by the amplitude of the wave function associated with that outcome squared. Now Schrodinger himself hated this formulation, which is actually why he invented the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. Put a cat in a box with a radioactive atom. Add a radiation detector that triggers the release of poisonous cyanide gas. Now, although it was only meant as a thought experiment, Schrodinger helpfully notes this device must be secured against direct interference by the cat. Anyway, the whole point of the experiment is to magnify the state of the atom up to the state of something macroscopic and tangible. He could have picked anything, it didn't have to be alive, but Schrodinger selected a cat. If the atom decays, the detector detects radiation, releases the poison, and the cat dies. If the atom doesn't decay, the detector doesn't detect radiation, poison is not released, and the cat remains alive. Since the state of the cat and detector apparatus are directly tied to the state of the atom, we say they are entangled. Where things get weird is that according to quantum mechanics, the state of the atom does not have to be either decayed or not decayed. Generally, it's in a superposition of both, decayed and not decayed at the same time, assuming no measurements have been made. This superposition state of the atom gets entangled with the detector, and then the cat. So after some time, the wave function of everything inside the box is in a superposition of the atom has not decayed, poison not released, cat alive state, and the atom has decayed, poison released, cat dead state. 
So, according to quantum mechanics, the cat really is both alive and dead at the same time. Only when we open the box and make a measurement does the wave function collapse and the cat actually becomes either dead or alive. Well, you can see he discusses Schrodinger's cat, which actually is based on the decay of an atom, which, as I said, has a cause, neither happens or it doesn't happen. There's no such thing as a superimposed state in reality. Surely you can look at it mathematically like that, but that's not what's really going on. There's not two superimposed states. The cat's not alive and dead at the same time. It's either alive or dead because that decay interaction happens whether we're observing or not. It's not a two-part thing where nothing happens when we're not observing and then something doesn't happen until we observe or measure it. Certainly, things happen when we observe and measure it. But the universe functions without us. There's a middle ground between those two answers. And the middle ground is what's correct. The universe is always functioning, whether we are observing or not. And it has true cause and effect relationships. And with that, I'll play a third clip. So, a more realistic account of Schrodinger's cat goes like this. The radioactive atom evolves from 100% not decayed into a quantum superposition of decayed and not decayed. The detector becomes entangled with this superposition state of the atom. But the detector is being bombarded by all these air molecules and photons in the box, which would bounce off differently if it is detected radiation than if it hasn't. So almost immediately, the detector becomes entangled with the state of the environment. It decoheres, branching the wave function in two. At that moment, you are split into two identical copies, one entangled with each outcome of the experiment. You continue to be identical until you open the box, but in this case, the cat actually is alive or dead. You were just finding out by opening the box. What we are unaware of is that the other outcome also happened, just to someone who is not you anymore. I mean, both observers came from you, but they are no longer you, and they are no longer identical to each other. This interpretation of quantum mechanics is called Many Worlds, and it was formulated by Hugh Everett. And if it's true, the branching of the wave function is happening all the time, so frequently, in fact, that the rate may well be infinite. Creating infinite, subtly different worlds all the time may sound implausible, to put it mildly, but consider that all those worlds are naturally part of the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Many Worlds just takes them seriously. To get rid of them requires something like the collapse of the wave function. And the point is, our experience of reality would be the same in the many worlds picture as it is if the wave function collapses. But the formalism is so much cleaner and more elegant. All we have are wave functions that evolve under the Schrodinger equation. The implication is that the founders of quantum theory may have got it exactly backwards. The wave function is the complete picture of reality and our measurement is just a tiny fraction of it, the part we become entangled with when we interact with a quantum object in a superposition. The universe also goes back to being deterministic. Every outcome happens 100% of the time. It only doesn't look that way to us because we only experience our tiny sliver of the multiverse. So as you can see, Derek is still set on the main world's interpretation, at least for this video and has doubled down on it and he in particular he says that we'll do away with the observation well that's good because the observation and measurement isn't that important but what's important is that the universe is still functioning there's still causes causing decay so it's still either decayed or not and it's not in a superimposed state so there's no many worlds. It's just a bunch of nonsense. As I say, it's physics for crazy people, in my mind. And one of the big things you have to think about are there's no mechanism to form a new world. We're physicists and we're talking about physics. There has to be a physical mechanism for something to happen. It doesn't happen by magic. You just don't go, poof, we have new universes. And, of course, a 
one of the big complaints about that is where does the energy come from? Because you have 10 to the 80th protons or so, some such number and electrons. And so you have a tremendous amount of energy. And that's not counting the quantum field energy. And, and Sean Carroll says the wave equation has all the energy of all the multiverses combined. But he forgets to say is you have 10 to the 1,000th multiverses splitting every billionth of a second, so you get 10 to 2,000th, and then 10 to 4,000th, and 10 to 8,000th. Dividing the number of multiverses by the multiverse's energy of the total divided by infinity is essentially zero uh, if, if you're, as you approach infinity. So the energy in these universes would be zero. His, his, his argument makes no sense, and, and I'll let you watch it. How is energy conserved is completely clear in the math. Uh, the energy of the whole wave function is 100% super duper conserved. But there's a difference between the energy of the whole wave function and the energy that people in each branch perceive. So what you should think of is not duplicating the whole universe, but taking a certain amount of universe and sort of subdividing it, slicing it into two pieces. The pieces look identical from the inside, except that one has spin up and one has spin down or something like that, but they're really contributing less than the original to the total energy of everything. Uh, let's ask the question about how many worlds yeah. there are, how frequently are they branching? Right, we have no idea. There's a short answer to this. Uh, and I think it's embarrassing that we don't have any idea. Um, it's certainly often, it's certainly a lot, right? The universe branches whenever a quantum system in superposition becomes entangled with its environment. So you have atomic nuclei in your body that are radioactive. They decay 5,000 times a second. There's a radioactive decay in your body. Every one of those either decays or doesn't. You can think of it as a superposition. And once it decays, it sort of interacts with what's around it becomes entangled and the universe branches its wave function, right? So branching is happening many, many times a second just because of radioactive decays in your body. Now, is it happening infinitely often? We don't know because we don't know whether the total number of possible branches is infinitely big or finite. Uh, it's jai humongous by any stretch. There's plenty of room for all these branches to exist and it might very well be finite, but that the details hinge on things we don't understand about quantum gravity and cosmology and the theory of everything and all that stuff. So it's a big number, but we don't know how big. Well, I cut the interview short. It's about six minutes and that's only the first minute and a half. Um, because watching his interview reminded me of an old W.C. Field saying, if you can't dazzle them with brains, baffle them with bullshit. And that appears to be what's going on here. It's not physics at all. Uh, it's not even scientific at all because it's not based on a physical reality or anything that's been observed. And so I didn't think a whole lot of this video, <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed my breakdown of it. And if you do, please like it, share with your physicist friends, subscribe for more of my videos. And while I don't talk about multiverses much, except in my Hunter Gray Slides in Physics book, only briefly, I, I would hope you would consider buying one of my books to learn more about my physics research. So thanks for watching.